it's, uh, it's, it's um, dumps for you. It's uh, no break. <laughs> uh, so, so I'm going to tell you things about uh, seafloor spreading. Uh, another way of saying it, it's the plate divergence processes at Midosnik ridges. I, I will, uh, and we see a, pic a picture of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge there. So I, I will organize the, the presentation. First, I will just show maybe four or five maps just to give you a, a map overview of the present day uh, mid Snick Ridge system. And, and then I will uh, uh, go on uh, talking about uh, mid Snick Ridge ridges processes and I will, I will take a kind of a historical approach at least at the beginning. And uh, I'll talk about uh, concepts and new and old questions and, and questions that I think are most exciting uh, for, the, for the future. So map, so that's the first map. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, bathymetric. It shows you the, 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 the topography of the seafloor. We call it the bathymetry. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it shows you that uh, you go basically from zero to uh, more than uh, 6,000 and up to, it doesn't show, but in these very dark areas next to the subduction zones, you can go down to 10,000 meters. Uh, the ridges, the middle uh, sneak ridges are these things there that are in, the, in colors that correspond to depth typically between uh, 2,700 and 3,500. Uh, and uh, another number that's useful is uh, that they extend over more than 60,000 kilometers. They extend actually over more if you count the small ones that I'm not going to talk about that are in the, what we call the, the back arc basins. Behind some subductions, you've got some oceanic opening, and uh, you've got ridges there. But the large ridges, they, they cover 60,000 kilometers. Uh, another map uh, is, uh, is a seafloor age map. It's built based on, on uh, magnetic anomalies, uh, because, because as the, the seafloor is created, it's, uh, it's uh, the basalts that are erupted but I, I shouldn't tell you about the basalts yet, but uh, what they do, they freeze the orientation of the, of, the, of, the, um, of the magnetic field at the time of the eruption. And because the magnetic field uh, goes uh, 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 in, has inversions and that we have uh, data on the dates of these inversions, we can date the seafloor. And we see that the ridges, of course, are very young. Uh, they correspond to ages less than one million years. This, this is the scale. And, and the other thing that is really, really, really interesting and important is, uh, even though it seems like uh, everybody knows it, but it's, it's like the, 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 the oldest uh, oceanic plates uh, are less than 200 million, million years old. And that's, that's really peanuts compared to the uh, age of the Earth. So, so it tells us that uh, two-thirds, most almost two-thirds of the surface of our planet is extremely young compared to the age of the planet. And that has a, a lot of interesting consequences. Uh, so one of the consequences it, it has, of course, and the way we, we know to explain it is, is that uh, the ridges are one of the components of uh, the plate tectonics. So, okay. so the ridges are here. They're not really uh, put in evidence in this sketch. Uh, because the sketch focuses on the subduction, but of course the reason, I mean, it's, it's, it's all part of the same system of plate tectonics, and, and the, the ridges are able to create uh, uh, more uh, seafloor because, because the seafloor, the old seafloor, is being subducted back into the mantle. And in other words, if you, if you think of the, of the present-day uh, oceans, uh, there, are, there have been many... Uh, 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 large volumes of uh, oceanic lithosphere and crust. Lithosphere is another way of saying the plates, basically. But, but there has been large volumes that have been created during, during past plate tectonics and that have been recycled into the mantle. And, and so the plate tectonics that we see as plate on the surface of the Earth, it's not just a, a process that affects the surface of the Earth. It's really a process that affects the Earth uh, as a whole, at least uh, in terms of the mantle, and certainly also has an influence on, on what's happening in the core uh, and, and probably with us. Uh, in the same is true the other way around. So, so it's, it's important to think of uh, what we see at the, at the ridges, uh, and we are going now to focus on ridges, 
to, to places where everything that happens is less than one million years old. But, but what we are looking at is processes that are contributing to, to uh, um, forming what's being recycled and modifying the, the composition of the mantle in ways that we don't really very well know uh, yet. So we, we have uh, many ideas. So. Okay, so another map, and I think it's the last one. And uh, so, so Christophe told you about this, uh, this Nouvelle One model of relative plate motions. Uh, it's, it's a model that is based on magnetic anomalies. It's based on the, on the most recent prominent magnetic anomalies. So basically, it's, a, it's an average of the, of the plate motion over the past uh, one to three million years, depending on the area. And, uh, and uh, Christophe told you that it was really striking and it's a first order result that the GPS, uh, very, very recent, almost in instantaneous compared to plate tectonic rates, uh, move at the same velocity. So, but, but, uh, but um, uh, except at some places and, and that makes them very interesting to study. Uh, so, so these are the, the, the plate motions along the, the main ridges and, and what, uh, what is worth Noticing is that uh, they range from, uh, of course, almost zero or zero uh, in places where you have a ridge. There are not that many places where you, you do, but, but for example, the, mid, the continuation of the mid-Atlantic ridge in the Arctic Ocean that's not shown on the map, uh, it, it actually uh, gets all the way to the Siberian coast. And because the, the pole of opening of the, of the Atlantic is, 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 close, is, is close to there, you actually have a ridge that goes all the way to its rotation pole, which is not the case for all plates. For example, for example, this 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 ridge here, the the central, the southeast Indian ridge, uh, its rotation pole is probably somewhere not on the ridge at all. So so therefore, it never reaches zero, but the Atlantic reaches zero, and so it goes from zero to about 35 millimeters per year, the opening rate. And, and then you have very slow ones, uh, like the Southwest Indian Ridge and, and the northern part of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge that goes only 14. And then you have one order of magnitude difference with the fastest, which is the East Pacific Rise, that goes 16 centimeters per year. Not, not along its whole length, but, but along some sections of it. So, so you, you get, you, you, and, and, uh, and for a reason I'm going to show you soon, uh, we, we have the, the um, we, we classify, we give names because part of science is, uh, is to give names. Uh, <clears throat> sometimes you regret that names were given and, and you would think that a better name could, be, could have been chosen because you learn more about the process and you find, but in any way, uh, in this case, it's, it's robust. It was, uh, it's a name that was given in the, I'll show you in the late 80s and, and it sticks still now because it's useful. Uh, when it goes less than four centimeters per year, so that's the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, the uh, Southwest Indian Ridge, for example, we call it a slow ridge. And when it goes more than eight centimeters per year, like the East Pacific Rise, we call it a fast ridge. And in between ridges like this one, for example, it's an intermediate uh, spreading ridge. And the total length of slow ridges is 32,000 kilometers. So about half of the ridges uh, on Earth Presently, they are slow. And of course, there is a, a very uh, clear connection between, the, between the, the fact that the fastest ridge on, on Earth is also uh, uh, separating plates that, are, uh, that have a, a, the opposite boundaries of these plates are subductions. So it's, it's, uh, it's very clear that the, the, the subduction pool is a very efficient way of moving the plates and, and that it, it it, it pulls on the, on the corresponding ridge. Okay, so now I go to the, to the main part of my talk, uh, process, etc. And I start really early in the, in, the, in, the, in the story. I start with a really, like, just a, during plate tectonics discovery. And uh, at the very beginning, uh, the interesting thing is that uh, people didn't know that ridges were actually volcanic chains, okay? And so there, there was this very evolved, uh, involved uh, diagram that is uh, very uh, clever, 
uh, showing that, uh, that, that what happens is that uh, because you're pulling the plates apart and you're not creating a big, big, big hole, means that material must come up from the mantle. And, uh, and then what they had discovered was what we call the oceanic crust. So the, the oceanic crust was discovered as a ge geophysical object. And, and it's characterized by slow, slower seismic velocity. So the propagation of seismic waves is, is, a, is a, um, a slower than in the Earth mantle. And the density of the rocks are also sm smaller. So that's what defines the, 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 the crust. So at that time, they discovered the crust, but they hadn't discovered volcanism at the ridges. And so this, this was this interpretation that possibly the crust was created by, by alteration of the, of the mantle. And, and so it was a, a process we call serpentinization. When you add water to mantle rocks, you get serpentine. And the serpentine has a slower seismic velocity and a slower density. So that, that's this uh, early uh, uh, sketch. And uh, soon afterwards, of course, oops. So soon afterwards, of course, it was discovered that, uh, in fact, uh, ridges, middle sink ridges are the most important volcanic chain on Earth. More than half, I think, of the volcanic uh, uh, rocks, magmatism on Earth is expelled at, volcanic, at, at middle sink ridges. And, uh, and the reason why there are uh, volcanic chains is because the mantle, <laughs> as it rises beneath the ridge, as was correctly predicted by the, the early plate tectonic models, uh, it, also, it also decompresses, and uh, there is this thing called decompression melting. And, uh, and, uh, and, and as, as it melts, it produces the basalts that will create the, 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 the crust. And uh, this is based on results from, the, the, at that time there were lots of cruises, but, but not just cruises to, at sea of all sorts of techniques, sampling, etc. but also there were ophiolite studies. So the, the ophiolites are remnants of what we think are old oceanic lithosphere that have been uh, captured in orogenic, uh, in mountain belts. And, uh, and there were also experimental petrology, and it's the experimental petrology that uh, allowed uh, the process of decompression melting to be understood and parameterized. And this is an example, a more recent example, of a parameterization of the, of the solidus of a, of a mantle pruritotite. So you see it's made, it's parameterized with, a, with tens of, of uh, individual experiments where you take a pruritotite composition, you put it in an oven, you put it to a temperature under pressure, and you see whether it's melting or not. And, and then from that, you put the, the best possible uh, curve there. And, uh, and so we have the solidus of the mantle. The mantle comes up, and it's still at temperatures too low to, be, uh, uh, to reach the solidus. It comes up, the, 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 the arrow is a little bit not completely vertical, because you're losing adiabatic, uh, um, um, you're cooling adiabatically as you come up. And, and then as you cross the solidus, you start melting. And uh, you see that you lose more temperature because melting is a process that requires energy, so the temperature is, is diminishing. So that's, that's the, the, the processes, the first order processes that explains why middle sink ridges are, are magmatic chains. And then at about the same time, at the end of the 70s, uh, no, at the beginning of the 70s, uh, there were also, uh, from, from all of that, uh, a, a model proposed, a geological model proposed for the oceanic crust. Uh, so the first thing that was discovered was the, the crust geophysically, and, and it was discovered by the fact that it had slower um, uh, um, P wave uh, velocities than the mantle. So the mantle has eight kilometers per second, and the crust has less than that. And it was also shown that it had uh, several layers, etc. And, and then there, were, there, were, there was a famous conference in 1972 that put together geologists and, uh, petrolo and petrologists, experimental petrologists, and, and uh, people doing geophysics in the oceans. And they came up with this model in which they, they hypothesized that, uh, of course, the only thing we, they knew for sure was that the upper part was basalt. But then they thought that in, on, underneath you had to have a, a dike complex uh, taking the, the, the magma up to the eruption. 
And then underneath, they thought that they would have uh, what we call gabbro, which are magmatic rocks that have uh, crystallized more slowly. And a lot of that was based on the study of, uh, of, of ophiolites. And uh, just to, because it's, it's not a recent diagram, but if you were to put the many more points we have now on this same diagram, you would find the same thing. It's, it's another of these first order results. Uh, it's, it's a really striking that uh, if you go away from hotspots where the, the magmat magmatic budget is, of course, much higher, uh, and you, you measure the, the thickness of the seismic crust, or crust uh, all over the oceans, you find that there is more variation at slow spreading rates, but basically the, the average is around six kilometers. And of course, it's a first order result because it gives us a lot of constraints on the rate at which the mantle is coming up underneath the ridge, since it's the, the decompression melting that produces the melt and produces the basalt. If the mantle goes up much faster at some part, place than another for a plate that, uh, that is moving at the, at, the, at the constant rate, then you will produce more melt where the mantle comes up faster, okay? So the fact that you don't see uh, this, this variation, uh, that, that it remains very constant, uh, is, uh, is, is uh, really very important. It's, it's also very important because, to tell you the truth, we don't know much about uh, the composition of the upper mantle, really. There are uh, hypotheses, but nobody has sampled the pristine upper mantle as it starts melting beneath the ridge. And, uh, and the fact that we had to have an upper mantle that was, able, that was capable of, uh, of, uh, of uh, yielding six kilometers of crust uh, was kind of a constraint in, in making these model compositions of what the, the upper mantle should be made of. I don't, I don't know if I'm clear. So, so it's, a, it's a really important result there. Then to continue the story, uh, a little bit uh, later actually, uh, it was discovered that uh, the Middlesnick the ridges are not just volcanic chains, uh, they are also tectonic features, and that was discovered uh, 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 thanks to a, um, a big effort, the first uses of, uh, of, uh, of submersibles to do actual geology on the seafloor uh, at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge during a, a, a program that was called FAMOUS, and uh, that has remained so. <laughs> And uh, they explored the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and they found, well, it was known already that it was a valley, but, but they, they gathered a lot of information on the structure and, and the, 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 the way this valley was, was, was formed. And they showed that it was made, formed by faults. And then there were some other people, or actually kind of uh, the, the same, producing uh, the very first models uh, that, that uh, um, suggested that uh, in addition to volcanism, uh, Midocenic ridges are also places where it's not like your two plates are completely separated. Okay? You, it's not like you have your asthenospheric mantle at 1300 degrees uh, going up to the, to the, to the seafloor or to the, the base of the, of the crusts everywhere. You've got, because you've got cooling from above, you also got a plate uh, at the limit between the plates, if you want. <laughs> and this plate at the limit between the plates has to be, has to be deformed. And that was an early model that is, that is not... Uh, is not uh, uh, it, it, it would be very much different now. But, but that was the discovery that you also had to take into account uh, tectonics if you wanted to describe the processes at Middlesex ridges. And then, of course, the third... The third basic first order mechanic process at Middlesex ridges uh, is uh, hydrothermalism. And it was discovered uh, also before the, the end of the 70s. Uh, it was actually predicted uh, in the early 70s by, uh, by just because of, uh, of heat flow measurements uh, near, near the ridges. It was found that the heat flow was such that it was not possible to explain it just by conductive cooling of the ridge, that you had to have some convection, hydrothermal convection, uh, cooling more, because the ridges were too, too cold to, to... 
So, so it was predicted that we should find a hydrothermal uh, circulation. And then uh, the vents were actually discovered at the Galapagos Ridge uh, in 1977. Uh, so this is here. And then soon after, uh, they were able to go with a, with a submersible and, uh, and, um, and actually find that uh, there is very exciting uh, life forms that uh, don't rely on photosynthesis. Uh, at, at the bottom of the, of, uh, associated with these vents. So, so at that time we had all the ingredients, the vol magmatism, tectonics, and hydrothermalism. So, so now what I'm, what I'm going to do is more, um, uh, well, this next uh, sequence of slide is more like uh, going up all the way to the present and, uh, and uh, discussing um, a few of the, of, of the findings that are still significant and still a matter of uh, ongoing research uh, nowadays. And one of these is uh, how does spreading rates control uh, actual topography and also the balance between faulting and volcanism? Because now we have the ingredients, but the idea is to, to understand how they work together and what's their balance. And uh, one thing that was very early, found very early, was that fast ridges don't look at all the same as slow, slow ridges. Fast, slow ridges, we've seen they have an actual valley, and it's controlled by faults, and it's due to deformation of the plate within, between the plates. And, uh, but the fast ridges, they are a, a, domal, a domal shape. It's actually not a dome, because it's, a, it's, it's, it's really a ridge, and it's very continuous and very uh, uh, monotonous topography. And, uh, and, and of course, the interpretation is it's kind of intuitive. It's uh, that this looks like a long volcano. Instead of being round, it's just very long. So, so, so fast spreading ridges, they are really dominated by volcanism. And tectonics play a small part. And, and the opposite is the fact of, uh, is true for, for, for slow spreading ridges. But you see that volcanism is everywhere there in any case. This, this here is a, is a ridge. It's, uh, it's, it appears small compared to this one, but it's because the scale, the spatial scale here is the same in the two pictures, but the, the color scale for the depth is not the same. Here you go from 3,000 to 2,600, so you only have 400 meters, and here you've got uh, 1,200 meters. So, so, okay. So fast spreading ridges have an actual high that has a, a relief that is remarkably constant all over and is about 400 meters. And slow spreading ridges, they have an actual valley that has a relief that varies between 300 and 4,000 meters, 300 meters and 4,000 meters. For example, here uh, in this basin there, uh, next to a transform fault, uh, you go down to 6,000 meters and the mountain here is uh, less than 2,000 meters. So you've got 4,000 meters of, uh, of, um, of um, the, uh, relief here over something like uh, 15 or 20 kilometers. So it's an alpine type relief. It's really, it's really very, very steep. And it, these are a few views of what, what it looks like. And, and it's, it's actually views that are uh, generated using, a, I don't know if you know it, but it's a very useful uh, to online tool uh, 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 prepared by, it's, it's, it has been put together by the NSF as a way of giving access to, uh, to uh, ocean uh, databases, and it's called GeoMap App. GeoMap App. And, and so I use it for, to generate, uh, it, it gives access to all sorts of databases, including databases of ocean topography, and, and it's very, very useful and easy. So everything on that slide is made with a GeoMap app. So, so what I'm looking at is, uh, is the fast spreading East Pacific rise. And I'm showing you a, a, a section that I did with a GeoMap app. And you, see, you can see how the ridge is high. And you see 2,600, 3,000, you really have 400 meters high. And then, and then of course, it goes down because it's uh, the, the subsidence with, uh, with uh, cooling with age of the, of the, of the plates. And uh, I can find a, do a, a focus on this part here. And I see this very nice microbathymetry that was acquired with an with a echo sonder uh, mounted on a submersible. So it was uh, 
a survey with a few, at 50 meters above the seafloor, and so you, you, get, you don't cover much uh, surface, but, but you get amazing uh, resolution, like uh, 50 centimeters resolution. And what we see here is, that, is at the very top of this high, you've got a small uh, uh, ribbon, or, or rather it could even be described as a fissure. And what you see coming from this fissure are these things here and here and here and here, and they're not art artifacts, they are collapsed lava tubes. And what you see here, these, these rounded shapes, they are the, the fronts of the individual lava, la lava flows, okay? So, so what it shows here is that almost most, I mean, the vast majority of the volume of volcanics that is coming out of, fast, of this fast spreading ridge is coming out of this very narrow fissure. fissure. It's less than 100, 100 meters uh, wide. And, and uh, it's coming as uh, lava flows in first in tubes, and, and then it goes kind of some distance. So I, the distance can be shown with the, with the, 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 the section, so that would be a few kilometers off. Uh, and, and then the, some of the tubes collapse. And uh, now I show you uh, the same thing for the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, except that uh, I, I didn't, I, I'm not going to focus on, on, uh, on bathymetric details now, late, uh, uh, but, but uh, show you this cross-section, and you see, the, you see the cooling with age effect, and you see the actual valley that's uh, much wider. It's, uh, from here to here, it's about... Uh, 40 kilometers from top of the of the walls to top of the wall, and it's of course much deeper. It's uh, one 2,000 for 4,000, so it's uh, it's almost uh, uh, it's more than 2,000 meters uh, deep. And you see also that it's uh, in this case slightly asymmetrical. Okay, in some cases it's even more asymmetrical in here or in here, which is the place where we were looking at it uh, before. And uh, what's, what's interesting is, uh, is, is when we do a diagram uh, of spreading rate against this actual relief. So the actual relief is shown as black dots for the slows for, for, for when you have a valley. And, uh, and the actual relief is, is shown as open dots when you have a, a high. So you see the highs are always uh, about 400 meters. And but the valleys are very variable. And, uh, and, and this is on this diagram that I can explain why it makes sense to, to make the distinction between fast and slow with these values here. Is if you look at ridges on present day Earth where you have a, never a valley, uh, you need to go to eight centimeters per year. And if you want to go to places where you never have a high, well actually uh, it's, uh, th this is already old, so you, you, the best bet is to sh to choose for 40 millimeters. And in between, you can have one or the other. So now the, the, the idea is to try to understand uh, what's happen, happening in these two very different uh, uh, contexts. And uh, geophysics comes to the rescue. Uh, two types of geophysics. For the fast spreading ridges, the most uh, uh, the, the the biggest discovery was made with a uh, seismic reflection. Uh, it was made uh, quite early, and it's completely confirmed uh, now that uh, when you when you look at the seismic structure of uh, the actual high, you find a very strong reflector uh, that is uh, something like uh, one to three kilometers uh, below the seafloor. And this strong reflector is very strong, and when you when you uh, have a um, seismic refraction data that allow you to model the seismic velocities uh, corresponding to the reflector, you find that the only way to explain this reflector is by having a lot of melt. So, so the, the idea is that uh, this is interpreted. At all. So at the beginning it was called AMC, which, in, which means actual magma chamber. Now we call it AML, which means actual magma lens, because we know that it's not the top of a big magma chamber. It's, it's just a very melt-rich lens that's sitting on top of a melt, mush, a melt crystal mush, if you want. Uh, it's solid, but it has a lot of interstitial melt. And, and so 
what it tells us is that we've got melt at less than two or three kilometers below the seafloor. And melt, basaltic melt to be molten, has to be at temperatures at least 1,100 degrees. So it gives us a very strong constraint on the, on the thermal regime at the axis, which has to be pretty hot because you go from two degrees in the seawater to 1,100 degrees at two kilometers depth. So it's, uh, and, and, but the situation is completely dif different at, at slow ridges, and I show you the first example, the discovery of this uh, in 1985, was with an experiment with uh, seismometers on the seafloor just listening, and listening to the natural seismicity. And uh, there are lots of earthquakes at slow spreading ridges, uh, usually less than f magnitude five, but, uh, but, and, and a lot of very small magnitude earthquakes. And uh, what they discovered is that when they relocated these earthquakes just beneath the actual valley, they would have uh, relocations down to eight kilometers. So what it means is that, uh, is that the seismogenic, and that's shown here in a model, um, I'll come back to, to, to it. At slow spreading ridges, the seismogenic plate is at least eight kilometers thick. Okay, so no wonder we have faults and we need to extend it because if we want our two plates to move, we have to continuously break this, uh, this, this, uh, this plate. And uh, okay, so, so what, what we can do, what has been done early on, is put these results, these constraints, on a diagram showing half spreading rate, depth. And uh, it's a composite diagram because in the part of the fast, what it shows you is the 11 degrees isotherm, which is interpreted as the, the magma temperature. And for the slow spreading ridges in blue, what it shows you is the maximum depth of earthquakes, which is interpreted as the, the maximum depth, the depth of the brittle ductile transition. And that would correspond to temperatures more in the order of 700 degrees. So it's a composite diagram, and, and you can derive models, thermomechanical models, that are able to reproduce this uh, evolution. And I'm showing you one. I'm sh and at that time, they were very, very basic models. And I'm showing you uh, one of these models. This is actually the, the model that was used to do the diagram uh, after. Uh, so, and, and forget about the title, I, I come back to, to it uh, after. Uh, and, and also forget about a 2D conductive model because it's of course not just conductive, it's also advective because one of the components is the, the, the mantle. So in the model, you have the, pass the mantle that is passively upwelling beneath the ridge, meaning that it upwells just at the right velocity to fill the void between the two plates. Uh, and as it, as it comes up, it melts and it produces melt. And in the model, the melt is, is, uh, is treated as a, a source of heat that is emplaced uh, over the thickness of the crust, six kilometers at exactly the right rate to, to explain the, 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 extension, the separation of the plates. And if you, if you do that, so you've got your heat source. So heat is provided by the advecting mantle and by the, the, the magma. And, and then you cool that conductively. Okay? And, uh, and, and what happens is that this is what you get. Uh, and, and this is for a slow spreading ridge. It's two centimeters per year. What you get is a brittle ductile transition that corresponds to the, to the, 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 duct, the brittle layer is in gray here, and this, it's limited by isotherms. And, and uh, what you get is a plate that is only, say, two kilometers thick on axis, and we are at a slow spreading ridge. And we know that we have evidence from seismicity that our plate is at least eight kilometers thick. So that was a, 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 a nice thing of this modeling of showing us that we needed a lot of hydrothermal cooling. We don't just need a little bit of hydrothermal cooling. We, we need a lot of it. We need, uh, we need and, and we can actually conclude that hydrothermal circulation transfers most of the, the magmatic heat uh, to, to, the, to the ocean. Uh, the magmatic heat of mid ridges, which I recall, uh, remind you, is, uh, is, is, is the main magmatic chain on Earth. So now I'm going to show you some, some of what we, so these are more, 
more recent findings about hydrothermal. So we go now to hydrothermal, uh, to the hydrothermal components. First, as at fast spreading ridges, and at fast spreading ridges, the, the, the main uh, discovery, which shouldn't have been a discovery, but we also had, we also have a, we always have a tendency to draw pictures of ridges <coughs> across axes. Okay, because we, we want to show that they are creating plates. But actually, especially in a ridge like the fast spreading ridges, where you've seen that most eruption is occurring in a very narrow zone along axis, it makes every, clearly more sense to look at, to expect things to be uh, driven along axis. And, and, uh, but, but, but we, it's funny how uh, researchers sometimes uh, find the evidence <laughs> And it shouldn't have been taken so long to find that. But it was uh, really completely de demonstrated by, by uh, uh, again, uh, the recording of natural seismicity. Very, very, very small earthquakes, magnitudes uh, less than, than zero, minus magnitudes, uh, that, are, that are recorded, that are really located only along axis beneath the vents at the, at the fast spreading ridge. And, and it can be shown that these earthquakes go down to the depth of the meltlands. And so it's, they are interpreted as, uh, as cracking of the rocks uh, and, and as, as the hydrothermal uh, uh, downwelling is, is uh, taking the heat out of the magmatic rocks. So that was, uh, and, and, and so it's, it's really showing the coupling between the magma dynamics in the actual, and in, in the actual magma lands. And uh, more recently, but maybe I will skip that because I only have uh, 400 and I will go to slow. So, so, so slow, it's, I, I wanted to have a full section on hydrothermal, but as, as you've seen, hydrothermal is a matter of coupling water penetration in the lithosphere with magma dynamics. And magma dynamics at slow is not that straightforward. So I found that I needed first to say a few words about magma dynamics at, at slow spreading ridges. So let's go back to this situation. We've got this uh, actual plate, actual lithosphere that is at least uh, uh, eight kilometers thick for its brittle part. And, uh, and, um, and we've got to, to pull it apart as, as we have the mantle upwells. Uh, we've, we've got eruptions on the surface. We know that there is magmatism happening, but we also have large faults that are pulling apart this, uh, this thing. And uh, this is an, an old paper, and, and you will see how the fault is not drawn the same now. But the idea is the same, is that uh, in order to, to, to pull the plates, you, you've got to have these faults. And what we discovered that uh, these faults were not just uh, uh, kind of cutting a little bit, having offsets of a few kilometers, they, they were having offsets that were enough to accommodate the emplacement of mantle-derived peridotite at the seafloor. In other words, the faults are capable of taking, you've got the, the asthenospheric mantle here, it cools as it hits the base of the, cross, of, of the plate, and then the faults are able to take it up all the way to the seafloor. And uh, what's happening is that as it goes up, it gets intruded by magma. And so when we get the samples at the seafloor, we've got a kind of composite history of magmatism in these peridotites. And, uh, and during petrology, uh, we were able to uh, propose a, a, a sequence of magmatic events. And so what it says is that the, the, we don't have a simple melt lens that stays at, uh, at a given depth. We have to always wonder where the melt can be at, at any given situation. And I show, I, sh I show you more uh, accurate and recent uh, views of what these faults look like. And this was uh, again discovered uh, largely because of, uh, of uh, monitoring of active seismicity. It was discovered that these, that these faults actually have a, have a, a concave downward shape. And uh, instead of going like that, they go like that. And the reason they go like that is because you've got flexure of the, of the football plate as it becomes unroofed, it flexures. And uh, this gives a, a very uh, spectacular uh, uh, domal type uh, um, topography. And the idea is that, uh, is that as it goes up, uh, same as before, same, same as uh, 30 years ago, uh, it gets intruded by, by, by magma. 
And, and therefore, uh, uh, hydrothermal circulation has to kind of find its way to the most recent magmatic uh, intrusion because, of course, hydrothermal circulation wants uh, hot, I mean, not necessarily magma, but hot, very hot magmatic rocks. And so this leads to, uh, to um, this, this uh, um, idea that, uh, that actually at slow spreading ridges, you, you also, in some places, in quite a few places, you've got another type of crust. Uh, it's different from the Penrose type oceanic crust, uh, and it's made of a mixture of fluidotites and, and, and magmatic intrusions that have been intruded all the way uh, through the tectonic emplacement of the mantle. And this is estimated to represent about 25% of the, of the crust of the seafloor that has been created at slow ridges, and that's uh, represented uh, presently, it's represented here. Uh, so, can I take a few? Yeah, uh, I don't know, actually I don't see my presentation, so I, we will see. <laughs> so, so in any case, so, at, so, so what it means is, what it leads to uh, is, that, uh, is that hydrothermal circulation is much more difficult to study at slow spreading ridges, the one that's triggered by magma, but we also discovered another type of hydrothermal circulation at slow spreading ridges that is not fueled by magma. So it's a low temperature uh, hydrothermal uh, systems that are not as energetic, but that are bringing fluids that are produced by serpentinization. And these, uh, these uh, cir hydrothermal circulation produce uh, edifices made of uh, carbonate and also uh, magnesium uh, um, products uh, that precipitate because the fluids that come out uh, have a much higher pH than the seawater. And, and so the, as a result, the magnesium, the CO2, and the, uh, and the ca carbonate in the, in the seawater precipitate and, and produce these edifices. And uh, so that's, that's, I will pass on that. I wanted to show you just two things about these different types of hydrothermal circulations. So we've got uh, two types of magma fueled, one on basalt, uh, on basalts, one that is magma fueled but uh, set on pruritotites. And the interesting thing about this one is that uh, it, it, has, it releases a lot of hydrogen compared to this one that is uh, basalt hosted and doesn't have. And, and then the, the difference with the non-magma fueled is, is seen with the pH. The pH of the fluids that are, that are uh, corresponding to circulation fueled by magma, hot, they are black smokers, uh, is, very, is low. And, and uh, the, the serpentinization-associated uh, circulations have high pH. And I think it's... Uh, I just have three slides now. So... so um, but maybe I will, well, okay. So, so one, one thing that's really not understood with these hydrothermal systems, in addition to exactly where the magma source can be, <coughs> source spreading ridges, is uh, exactly what is their flux and how, how, do they, um, how much heat do they release. And the reason is that uh, it's easy to, it's relatively easy to calculate the heat flux of a smoker but it's very difficult to calculate the heat flux of something like that, where you have a, a fluid that is kind of mixed with seawater and oozing over large surfaces. And when you try to do that, you've got large errors, of course, uh, but, but you see that consistently the smokers bring, do not bring up most of the heat. Most of the heat comes out of that. And the other interesting thing about these fuse uh, uh, venting areas is that it's where the life is, because the life is not associated with 350 uh, te degrees temperature, uh, little uh, metal-rich fluids. It's associated with these diffuse fluids. Okay. And, uh, so, and so this I just wanted to say that uh, nowadays to try to understand these processes, because these, these diffuse fluids are produced in very complex ways near, near the surface, uh, we, need, we develop uh, seafloor observatories with, uh, with instruments to monitor these, uh, these processes and try to, to understand them. And I finish with two slides, okay? So these are just perspectives. 
uh, what I what I think uh, that that we sh as researchers should be doing now, uh, more, I mean, not uh, it's not inclusive, but among other things, when we study middle sink ridges, is to look at them more as part of a more of a global system that includes life and the ocean, and that really leads to goes back to what I said about hydrothermal circulations. And uh, also, uh, it's very interesting to use middle ridges as natural laboratories to monitor active processes such as faulting seismicity, volcanism, and fluid rock life interactions. And the reason is because th there are places where everything is less than one million years old. So you can look at these processes and know that it's recent. And uh, also, one reason is that it's now possible because we have the tools for underwater intervention and, and, and sensors to allow us to, to, to develop natural laboratories at the seafloor. And, and the other interesting thing, I think, and that hasn't been considered uh, enough yet, is to, to look back uh, at the old mantle under the young seafloor, because you remember that the ridges are where you, you create these plates that are recycled, but it, this has an effect back on the ridges. And for example, you, you see here the Southwest Indian Ridge, very clearly, there is a, 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 this is a map of the geoid, so it's the topography of the Earth. And it shows that there is something happening in the mantle underneath. And this happening in the mantle is maybe linked with the hotspot in this particular instance. But, but uh, in places like that, for example, where it's very low, it may be happening because there are old plates that have been recycled. And, and so now we, we, we have with the basalts at the middle sink ridges, we have a window into the mantle that's underneath them and can use it as a tool to better understand how the mixing occurred for the past two billion years of plate tectonics. Okay. Thank you.